Dr. Musty presented at the Iowa conference. He did a uh, study of all the studies that have been done for the on the states in the United States, the six states that had a medical marijuana program in the, in the late 70s. Please give Dr. Uh, Musty a welcome and your attention. What I'm going to do today is try to quickly cover the research that has been done on uh, multiple sclerosis, spinal cord injury, and actually some of its associated problems. There's not a huge amount of research, but there's enough, I think, to indicate that we're going in the right direction. We've already looked at some of these molecules. Um, this is the principal psychoactive component in marijuana, delta-9 THC, that Esther Frieda also already showed us. The second compound known as delta A THC, which is very similar to delta 9, but in the plant, uh, there's much less in the plant. Now, a much less known one is cannabinol. It has actions that are very much like THC. Um, they tend to interact with each other in an additive way. And finally, cannabidiol, which is a very interesting compound. And you're going to hear from Dr. Jeffrey Guy tomorrow, uh, where they have varied the amount of THC in the plant, this molecule here, and the amount of cannabidiol in the plant. And it's turning out that that's a very important interaction. Uh, uh, I won't steal this thunder. We'll wait and hear him talk about that. Now, the MF study started back in the 80s, and uh, Dennis Petro did the first one. Uh, where he, oops. Uh, Dennis Petro did the first one where he administered oral THC, that's Marinol, it wasn't Marinol then, it was just THC capsule and sesame oil. He had nine patients in a double-blind placebo study and he found a decrease, significant decrease in spasticity. Clifford uh, in 83 did an oral THC using 5 to 15 milligrams, nine patients, and he only re had reports of subjective symptoms, so the patient said, we feel better. So there was nothing very objective about it. Uh, Underlighter in 87 did an oral THC study using fairly low doses, two and a half milligrams, um, one, one to two times a day is not considered a very high dose. He had nine patients and did a double-blind placebo control, and he found a significant improvement when they got up to 7.5 milligrams of THC over a period of a day. Uh, Mike in 89 had a one patient smoke cannabis trial and he found improvement in tremor and spasticity and ataxia. Then in 95, Greenberg uh, did a study in which he had people smoke cannabis. Uh, Ken had a MS and he had a 10 normal control loop group. It was a double-blind placebo control study, and he found actually that there was impaired foster imbalance. Well, we, wouldn't, we, we shouldn't be surprised by this because, as we'll see when we see some of the GW data, not everybody responds positively to uh, different kinds of drugs. This whole list of individuals here collected uh, 10 MS case reports in which they found improved walking, balance, and appetite. Martin in 1995 in the UK, uh, where Navalone, which is a synthetic THC-like compound, did one patient and found improvement in spasticity and nocturia, which is urinary bladder problems or having to uh, urinate in the evening or at nighttime. And Paul Consoro and I did a survey of 108 patients, half of them in the UK, half of them in the United States, who have all reported smoking cannabis. And they all, uh, there was over 90% of the people at least in this, in this self-report study showed, told us that they had improved spasticity, improved balance. And over 90% said their pain was decreased as well. I didn't uh, put that in here. Uh, Claude Vanet has actually done a very nice study that isn't, in the, isn't published yet, but it's on the way. Uh, they prepared an oral plant extract in a capsule in Germany, 
or sorry, in Switzerland. They had 57 patients in the study, randomized in a double-blind crossover, which means that people started uh, with the drug in one group and without the drug in the other group, and then after some time they switched it around. And um, they got significantly reduced spasms, spasms in these individuals. So what we think at this time is it appears that cannabis uh, has effects uh, to reduce MS symptoms. And we'll see some more data when we hear from Dr. Guy tomorrow. Uh, we think at this point, further double-blind placebo control studies are warranted. And hopefully, uh, with the smoke material, um, that might happen in San Diego. I don't think it's going to happen anywhere else uh, in the United States. It could happen in Canada that has trials now approved for various conditions. Now, with spinal cord injury and movement disorders, and Dr. Uh, Sanchez Ramos is going to talk about the mechanisms act of action in the next talk. Um, Don did a small cannabis study in 74, an old one, with 10 patients who had spinal cord injury. Five out of eight of those patients had reduced spasticity, and four out of eight had reduced phantom limb pain, which is really an amazing thing. Uh, a lot of work should be done on phantom limb pain. Generally, surgeons uh, deny phantom limb pain, although the younger ones now are not denying it. Uh, I actually had a graduate student who lost uh, her leg uh, just an over the knee uh, in a farm accident, and she effectively controlled her uh, phantom limb pain. She had 35 stabbing pains a day when she started out with it, tried every drug in the pharmacopoeia, and then when she went over to, she didn't want to smoke cannabis because she had 14-year-old daughters, twins. So she used Marinol and got those stabbing pains down to uh, about one a day. And uh, for the first time after she started using it with pantom limb pain, she could sleep a whole night. So more work needs to be done on that. Uh, Petro again uh, had a, a small, just one patient uh, who had, sp uh, had spinal cord problems. He reported uh, decreased spasm of pain. Malik uh, in 1980 did a survey with 25 patients and 21 out of 24 uh, reported decreased spasticity. And then Paul Consor and I again did, oh no, this is Consor and others did a cannabidiol trial, which is interesting because cannabidiol is not acting the same way as I'll indicate later. And they had five patients with mixed dystonias and 25 to 50% decrease in the dystonias occurred. And there was in two patients a slight increase in tremor. We don't know why, I'm sure, at this point. Marr, 1990, did oral THC and compared it with codeine one patient in the double blind crossover, and he found that THC was equal to codeine in terms of controlling pain, and THC was better for spasticity associated with a spinal cord injury. Uh, Grinspoon, uh, anecdotal reports, had two paraplegic patients, and one with dystonia that had decreases in dystonic symptoms and pain, and then Conro, uh, and our group together surveyed 108 patients with spinal cord injury in the UK and the United States. And we had, again, over 90% of the people that reported back to us uh, reporting, 90% were reporting decreases in spasm from pain. Uh, Scott Imler had, in California, had several patients with quadriplegia who reported uh, decreased spasms in pain. And Sandik, uh, three patients with Tourette, interestingly enough, which is a different kind of motor disorder, uh, a decreased motor tick. Um, and then Kirsten Mueller-Ball uh, just recently published a study where she did a retrospective study on 17 <coughs> patients. 82 of those patients uh, report, reported reduction in motor and vocal ticks. These are people with Tourette. And then she went on to do a nice little study where she did an oral study with um, THC, which titrated it up to 10 milligrams 
oral. And these were 13 patients with uh, Tourette syndrome and the double blind crossovers. And they found significant decreases in the ticks compared to placebo. Now, with urinary and bladder problems, uh, Grinspoon had four patients that reported improved bladder control. In our two studies, the MF study and the um, spinal cord injury surveys that I talked about before, over 90% of patients reported improved bladder control, especially at night. And Ulrika Hagenbach uh, has recently done a study not yet published in which she administered uh, Marinol in oral form and then THC hemisuccinate, which is a special preparation that's made into a suppository, very nicely absorbed. And she did six patients, uh, treated them for six weeks in two separate groups. And she found that Marinol increased bladder, bladder compliance, which means they didn't have to get up and urinate so much in the evening by 65%, and the THC uh, suppository by 53%. So that's pretty aggressive. So what might be the mechanisms of actions in dystonias? Well, actually way back, a long time ago, Paul Conzor and I tested some mutant mites that had dystonia and torticollis, which is the turning of the head. And we found that cannabidiol reduced dystonic behaviors in the tortic and torticollis in a dose-dependent manner, which was indicating that we were getting some real pharmacological effect. And um, what we think is that cannabidiol is behaving as an antagonist to the, oops, antagonist to the receptor because uh, Francois Petitie has shown that cannabidiol acts as an antagonist in the microvolar range. And then, uh, in regard to MS, Baker and colleagues in the UK have tested a mouse that has spasticity and tremor. That's called the Biasi ADH mice mouse. And um, antagon agonists of the receptor, which are synthetic and much more potent than THC, the JWH133 and the WIN55212, as well as THC and the natural cannabinoid. Uh, methanad methanandamide uh, blocked spasticity and tremor in these mice. And then they went on and gave that compound that uh, Dr. Fried had talked about, SR141716A, 14, 14, which is an antagonist, and they found they were able to reverse the blockade of the spasticity and tremor. Uh, and then when given alone, the SR compound actually made the symptoms worse. So these data seem to confirm that cannabinoid agonists reduce clinical signs of MS and spinal cord injury, and an antagonist, CBD, seems to reduce dystonic symptoms. We're currently doing some work with uh, inbred uh, mutant dys dystonic mice, and we're having great success with cannabidiol on a, on a, in a different animal. So we're becoming quite confident that these are real effects in the brain. And uh, what we are concluding is that these animal studies are helping us to really understand that we're having a real pharmacological effect in the brain. And I'd like to thank the Open Society Institute for a product, Individual Project Fellowship to do some of this review work that I've done. It's a very small piece of a larger pro project uh, doing these reviews. My colleague Paul Tonsero at the University of Arizona. Richard Dale at Winona State University and my graduate, Super Rossi. Thank you.